Welcome to the 12 Step Recovery Evolution podcast. Visit recoveryevolution.co.uk for more episodes, helpful resources, and links to our social media. Also, visit the site for information on how you can attend a future Zoom session or workshop live. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Good to see everyone. Uh... I don't know where the weekend ends and the week begins now. <laughs> it's not one long day going on. But um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, what, what I was thinking about over the weekend, and uh, thanks to Ricky and Louise for their talks. I haven't heard them yet. Um, so I look forward to listening to them. But again, um, some of the conversations I've been having with different people over the weekend, and certain things obviously come into my mind. And then this morning as I was sort of plodding around thinking, you know, what we're going to talk about today is, is that I was realising that even now we've probably done, I don't know, somewhere like 16 hours I've been talking of podcasts over, over different subjects. And you still think, man, there is so much to learn about um, spirituality and recovery. And but you're always, especially when you're t- t- doing podcasts or doing talks, you're just trying to always get people to make sure that they're that they're at the beginning. And I think with somebody like myself, I kind of realised that over the years I spent a lot of time. It's not a complaint; it's just an observation. Is trying to convince people to do the program, and again, some people find that a bit offensive when you're around the fellowship that they don't think that. You necessarily have to work the program in any order or go into meetings and talking about your problems getting a sponsor is enough and but you know again I'm one of them people I guess considered a more religious member I'm a I'm a big booker and I believe that in doing the principle so I tend to I guess sort of preach that message that um, about the principles but and again it's quite controversial and I kind of find it a little difficult talking even in one-to-ones about it. Remember, I'm saying this because we're talking about working with others. What we've been talking about last week, uh, and I'm going to carry it on, is about working with others, is about the 12th step. And so this is my personal experience of doing 12th step as individuals, but then also um, doing a 12th step in a group or just even in a meeting, carrying the message in a meeting. You, 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 You... your desire is I want to carry a message that's gonna that's gonna help somebody else and I want it to be coherent but there seems to be a lot of things to know and so you know I was kind of taught that when you're sharing you should talk about step one tell people what it used to be like step two what happened and then step three what it's like now and when I share that content in that in them in that structure, I'm telling other people that are new, that are just beginning and learning, I'm starting to share with them what I did. I'm starting to share my experience, my strength, and my hope. I tell them, look, this is what it used to be like. I was drunk and I was struggling and didn't know what to do. And then what happened? I I come to AA and and then I. I learned the program and at least where drinking's concerned, my life's infinitely better. And and I come to meetings and I got a sponsor and I worked the steps and, you know, uh, I did this, that and the other. And so then you, you're carrying the message to people that wouldn't, that wouldn't know it. It's quite a big message and, and people are quite confused. And even in AA, you can get in all these kind of arguments that I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, well, I think I'm right, I'm right. And, you know, that happens in every walk of life. I get that. And so from my part, when I'm trying to to do this, I'm trying to just try and get people to say, look, that this is about discipline. You know, because, again, in on the awakening, it talks about discipline. Now, Again, it says alcoholics and addicts are an undisciplined bunch. And, you know, knowing myself and working with other people, it's certainly, I can certainly confirm that that's my experience as well, that 
most people just do not like any sniff of being told what to do, even if you're trying to direct them. And so discipline, it says we let God discipline us in this simple way. So again, just to break down the word discipline a bit, discipline is not punishment. It may include that sometimes when certain areas of life, but ultimately discipline is learning to practice certain principles as well. So if you want to be a hairdresser, then there's certain principles and disciplines that you may have to follow if you want to be a good hairdresser. Now, I think um, we've seen some of the haircuts that have come out of this isolation crew. So we know that anybody on planet Earth can cut hair. Anybody on planet Earth can cut hair. But if they've not learned the disciplines through practicing the principles that you learn at a college, then your haircuts are not going to be very good. Now, although we know that you can learn basic haircuts, just shave everybody's hair off. And, but even that, you know, uh, if you're trained, you can make that look a lot better. And so I think when it's talking about discipline, it's not about punishing or making people to do but we also know that if we went to if we went to hairdressing college and everybody just sat around talking about bad haircuts that they'd had in their life and then maybe a little bit about how to cut hair it's going to take forever to learn to cut hair now also know that if you just start cutting people's hair and you know for the first four years the people whose hairs you cut don't care that you give them a bad haircut, you may actually kind of get a lot better at cutting hair, but you're probably still not going to be as good as somebody of your calibre that went to college, that went to university, that learned the principles of hair cutting, and they give themselves to the discipline. And so I feel the same about like the fellowship. It's like, you know, you can get some pretty bad haircuts. But if you're willing to learn the principles and then practice them, you can get a better recovery and you can help other people get a better recovery. But even saying that, now I know some people are going to feel condemned by that. Some people are going to feel, who are you to tell us we're doing it wrong? Well, I'm not really saying it, you're doing it wrong, but again we can kind of see i see a lot of people relapsing and i've seen a lot of people relapse and people say well it didn't work for me and i'm like mate you probably went to a few meetings and you may have gone to hundreds of meetings and i know that i know people that go to hundreds of meetings and they constantly relapse over years and some of them a lot of them that i know end up dead but one thing I know is the ones that I know, not saying this is for everybody, but the ones I know, they didn't work the program. They wouldn't work the program. They were angry when you suggested to work the program. So for me, kind of talking in the way that I'm talking now, it is a bit uncomfortable, but I just want to be, and this is an opportunity for, for me anyway, to make it a little bit clearer of what i've been trying to do and for the people that are interested in saying look do you want to because again look, i'm talking to somebody that always talking to people that have been around for quite a while and again i can't talk for everybody i don't know everybody but i can only come to these conclusions in my experience and the people that i talk to but quite often i meet people that have been around recovery for a long time and They don't, some of them don't even understand what the principles are. And so again, I can only conclude, if you don't understand what the principles are, then how can you practice them in your life? And, and also, they don't really work the steps. They, they, you know, they, they say that they do, but when you actually put it up to this book and this program, 
it gets very difficult for them to continue believing that when when you go but you're not actually working these steps you're working some program and you know recently one of them said yeah do you know what i i work with a lot of people but most of them don't get sober either and again i think that's a bit sad and people's lives are at, at stake because i know that this program is a treatment for addiction and working these principles and practicing these principles is the treatment and so if you're not actually doing that or you don't know and, and you can i mean i think uh, eliza said that she went to meetings for a long time but didn't actually know about the principle so again it's not just kind of making this up this is kind of my experience and again i'm not saying it's happening a hundred percent everywhere but i do think it's worth saying what i'm trying to say and and you know it's not that i want to be fanatical i just really believe this program works but i don't honestly believe everybody's getting their fair chance to understand what this program is if people don't practice it as it's written in this book now i'm sure there's other ways it says we don't have the monopoly on god and i don't know about them other ways i just know that i believe this way works and i believe that the figures in this book are accurate when it says that 75 percent of the people that really tried did get sobriety over a certain period of time and you know when it says really have we seen a person foul who has thoroughly followed their path i kind of believe that also because again that's been you know the director of a rehab and working on the front line that's kind of been my overwhelming experience that people that work this program tend to do a lot better than them that i see that that are not working it even though they may go to meetings but not really work in a program. So, and again, because I believe that when anyone ever talks to me, the first thing I kind of do if they come and ask me for help, I go straight into the to the to the foundation of their recovery and say, look, I need to check and see if you're working this program. And again, my overwhelming experience is they're not. And so when people's lives depend on it, you kind of want to make sure that that they realize that these principles are a discipline and if you practice this discipline there's a 75 percent chance that you're going to stay sober for a long period of time but the but the numbers that are banded around about ai is that there's only a very small recovery rate and i think that's true but it's it's a small recovery rate based on the fact that people aren't really being introduced and methodically getting to work through this program and being surrounded by other people that are assisting them in doing that. <clears throat> and so, you know, doing, carrying this message to other alcoholics and practicing these principles in all our affairs i think is an essential thing to bang on about um, because again i've been banging on about it from day one look you you'll find it yourself when you start sponsoring people you know you're going to find it's, it's really difficult to get them to follow direction you know you'll find it is really difficult for them to get them to follow direction but one thing i've learned is that when they come into a group of people that are following direction and i've seen them i've been to like different countries and in america i've been to some groups where they're they're pretty hardcore you know they're pretty clear on what the program is and they're pretty clear on you know this is what you need to do and they're usually scorned at by you know the the mainstream around them but you know they have some pretty good recovery rates and uh and some pretty good um some pretty good uh sobriety going on and some you know some nice experiences to be around 
So I was just having a read through the How It Works chapter this morning and, you know, we got to the bit on page 89 where it said to be helpful is our only aim. And then I didn't want to read through too much of it because, again, it's uh, it's kind of one of them things that's probably done in a face-to-face -face study where you, because it does gives you direction about how you can actually help people and the best way to do it. But it does take a little bit more of a study environment because, this was written in 1937 and, you know, lots changed since then. But the principles are still good. One of the things when you're in a study group, and I'll tell you now, is that as they go through the big book and they come to chat things like chapters to the wives or to the employers, a lot of the time the people in the group think, well, that doesn't really, it's not really relevant to us. But, the you know, what, what we've learned and... Uh, in the groups that I've started in is that well in actual fact they are really relevant if you're going to do step work because the the principles that they're trying to highlight to the families are very powerful principles when you're trying to help somebody recover so when it comes to to the wives of course I'm not a wife but the principles contained into the wives are very good principles to understand when you're trying to help somebody recover from alcoholism or drug addiction and the same to the employees. So when you do ever get there, they're great principles. But the bit I wanted to probably labour on today was, was on page 92. Because again, this kind of... I don't want to be controversial. It's just hard not to be when you focus on the bits, I guess, that I see that I think are important. I think, you know, that they're important um, things to at least think about. And hopefully, you know, we can come to the same conclusions. But, you know, it can take a little bit of a conversation before that can happen. And, um, you know, there's lots of different views. I'm only giving you my point of view. That's up for you, whether you want to accept it, reject it, or, you know, tell me where you think I'm wrong. Um, but it says, the bit on 92, it says, it talks about, you know, how to approach an alcoholic. Um, when you've gone round their house, you talk to the family. But again, you tend, I might get an opportunity to do that sort of in the business that I'm in, but usually that's now done by Turning Point and... Uh, Change, Grow, Live and Phoenix Futures and them sort of organisations. Doesn't mean we don't get to meet people, but they're good places to go and volunteer. I don't know whether they want you to talk about recovery or not. That's something you have to discuss with them. But the bit that jumps out at me and the bit I kind of wanted to labour on a little bit today is that on page 92 it says, if you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, now, that term real alcoholic becomes a little bit controversial because it's, it's asking us that, that as we're talking to this person, now, they're obviously drunk, they're obviously in problem, they're obviously causing difficulty to their family, that their family are obviously desperate because of their drinking, but it's still asking us, is this person to determine whether this person is a real alcoholic or not? And then, um, because if we, if they're not, and we start following this instruction, it says, begin to dwell on the hopelessness of the feature of the malady, the maladjustment that the real alcoholic have. If this person's not a real alcoholic and doesn't have that malady or isn't maladjusted in that way, they're going to go, mate, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any of that go on. I just drink too much and my wife won't shut up. So he's sort of saying everybody that drinks may not be uh, alcoholic. So if we go to page 30 of the big book, now again, I'm not saying this to be controversial. I'm saying this because I'm talking to a lot of new people and hopefully it can help you in identifying what your problem is and help you to accept the treatment for your problem. Because if you haven't got this problem, you really don't need this treatment. So, and you may actually be around people that haven't got this problem, don't take this treatment, 
but they may be getting on all right. Now, I honestly think there's a massive, you know, and again, I'm not just saying this. This is, I think, a lot of people that talk against AA, a lot of people that don't want to believe in AA, they will always say there's a massive relapse rate in AA, which I agree. But my argument is that's because they're not being shown the program. They're not being given good treatment. Because my foundational belief is this, if you are an alcoholic, a real alcoholic, you're going to need a lot of treatment. Now, it may be for a short period of time, but you're probably going to need a lot of treatment for a long time if you are a real alcoholic. Now, if you're not getting enough treatment, you're probably not going to recover and you're going to relapse. So if you're diabetic, and I don't know what, how much um, insulin people take, so I don't know these numbers are accurate, but it's just an example. If you're a diabetic and you need 100 milligrams of insulin to resolve your diabetes problem, but you're only given five mil, and then you don't get better, it's because you're not getting enough treatment. And I don't think most people are getting enough treatment for this problem. And even in when they go in AA meetings, if they're not hearing about how to do the steps, how to work your program, look, all of the support and fellowship, that's all an important part of it. But this is the treatment. And then they relapse. And some of them don't know they didn't get the treatment because they said, well, I went to an AA meeting, it didn't work. Or they don't want to do it. That's fair enough. But I still need to highlight this. So on page 30, because, sorry, back in that bit we were talking about, it says, um, we suggested that you do this as we have done it in the chapter on alcoholism. If the alcoholic, if he is an alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with his own. So I think when it talks about the alcohol chapter to the alcoholic, I think it's it's this more about alcoholism. It's talking about page 30, which is more about alcoholism. And so just start reading at the beginning of that. It says most of us have been unwilling to admit that we are real alcoholic. So this word real alcoholic does come up quite a lot. And so, you know, if there was any need to make a distinction, they probably would have just said alcoholic. But even back then, it seems they knew that there was some distinction. He said, no person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. And what that's saying is, is again, none of us like to think we're different from other people. So this is obviously saying, but, you know, this is probably going to get to, well, you are different from other people. And, and but it's going to be a little bit difficult convincing you of that, especially if you're an alcoholic, as we're going to look into. It says, no person likes to think he is bodily and mentally indifferent from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking is characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we can drink like other people. Now, the other people bit is, is, is quite important to understand as well. When he's talking about the other people, he's talking about the people that aren't alcoholic. He's talking about the other people that can drink and control their drinking. He's talking about the other people that may even look like alcoholic, but they're not alcoholic, because when they're given a sufficient reason to stop or moderate, they do. But see, we kind of think maybe we're them other people. So the idea that somehow and someday we can control and enjoy our drinking is the great obsession. See, that, that's a, that, 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 that is what we've all been trying to do. When you think about it, the countless vain attempts is all I want to do is to be able to control my drinking. I never wanted to stop drinking. I never wanted to stop taking drugs. 
I just wanted to control it. I just wanted to do the right amount. I just wanted to drink the right amount. I didn't want to do that extra bit that caused all the trouble. I just wanted to, to feel good, to function. And, and I had countless vain attempts. I'm just going to drink one. I'm just going to not drink whiskey. I'm just going to drink vodka only. I'm not going to buy that much crack. I'm not going to buy this much heroin. I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm going to choose the small rock, not the big rock, like the leaflet said. I mean, blimey, if that's not really understanding a drug addict, I don't know what is. I mean, honestly, what person on crack in their life ever chose the small rock when the big rock was available? Controlled crack use. I mean, freaking hell. Look, if you can do that, there's probably people out there going, mate, I actually did choose the small rock, and now I only small the rock, and my crack habit's gone down from four big rocks every week to one big rock every week i'm like great you're probably not the real addict then that is talking about in here that you have managed to control your drug taking that means then you're not a drug addict of the kind in this that he's talking about here as far as i can tell it says the idea that somehow Someday you would control and enjoy drinking is the great obsession. It's that obsession in the mind that just one, one more, one won't hurt <clears throat> of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonished. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity and death. So when you're actually trying to tell people, look, you've got to stop that. If you're this, if you're the, if you're a real alcoholic or a real drug addict of this variety, you're not going to be able to control your drinking or your drug taking. It's not going to happen. Nothing's going to help me do that. Even if you're given legal drugs, that's not going to help you to control it. I mean, they're helping you to control it by doing that, but it's not going to control it in the long run. And you're not controlling it. They're controlling it. But if left to your own devices, you're not going to control your drug intake, whether it's bought off the street or given to you by a doctor. Now they may be able to control it for you, but you ain't going to be able to control it. And you're going to, if you go down that route, you're going to pursue this illusion into the, into the gates of insanity or death. So it's saying until we actually learn to fully, now the reason I'm saying it in this way is I'm saying it to you, but this is when you're doing 12 step work, what you're trying to help other people come to that as well. I'm not trying to convince them that they're alcoholic and addict. I'm just going to say you're not like other people. And that if I explain this malady, this um, process of thought, this, uh, oh, what was the word we used earlier? Maladjustment. If you've got this maladjustment like I've got, then you're going to need to stop. Because nobody we know with this maladjustment has managed to ever regain control that we know of. And if they say, well, I did, it's like, well, you haven't got this maladjustment. You're one of the other people. I'm, I'm not one of the other people. I'm one of the people that, that need to take this treatment. I can't sit around talking about my problems and drinking coffee and going to eat Indian food. It's nice, but it doesn't help me with my malady or my maladjustment. I need this program. He said, this is the first step in recovery. Again, is why we have the step before the step. It's because until people are willing to concede, then they very rarely want to do the steps. And often, you know, we see it even in treatment centers that people come there three, six months, they showing all the signs of somebody loving it and they're going to do it. But as soon as they leave the treatment center, they go and have a drink. They, they didn't concede and they were always going to do that. And then sometime down the road, they're on the phone saying I relapsed and it's like, well, did you do the program? And they're like, no. And it's like, well, you need to do the program then. And uh, some do and they do all right. And some don't, they carry on trying to make it work some other way. So it says, 
the delusion that we are like other people. And again, the other people are the people that can stop and they can moderate and they can control. They don't have the spiritual malady. They don't have this maladjustment. It has to be smashed. Now, again, it tends to be more people have to get to a place of reaching a rock bottom where it's just so bad for them outside. I do believe that rock bottom can be raised greatly by good intervention. But I don't think we often do good intervention in this country yet. I don't think we fully understand that good intervention is very powerful for people with this problem. And, you know, I don't think we need to, to let people harm themselves as much as they do to get to that brokenness. I think, you know, consequences tend to stop people drinking and drug taking. Um, some never get enough consequences, but most people have enough consequences that if there's a good intervention, then consequences can be brought into the to the place where they're at. And, and often it's quite astounding how quickly they can then make the decision to change and start working the program. He said, we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. So really, even being abstinent is controlled drinking. Being abstinent is controlled drug taking. But the only way that I can control it is to not do it. But I can't just choose not to do it. I need to have a program to help me choose not to do it. So again, I kind of like just throwing that in there, that abstinence is controlled drinking, but the only way I can control it is by not doing it. I can't control it by doing it, and I can't control drugs by doing them, but I can control them by not doing them, whether they're legal or illegal. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralisation. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics are a type that are in the grip of a progressive illness. So it always gets worse, never better over time. So again, that's another kind of sign that you're a real alcoholic, that, that your drug taking and alcoholism got worse. No matter how hard you tried to... to to resolve it, even your family, no matter how much help they give you, how much, what, they're all trying to help you control it, they're all trying to help you, but even like you go to a lot of government um, courses over the years, and again, a lot of people I know that have gone to them agencies, that they just got worse and worse and worse over the years, all that treatment, all that help, they just got worse and worse and worse as the years went by, and a lot of them died, and are dying now. It says, over any considerable period, we got worse, never better. We are like men who have lost their legs. They never grow back new ones. So it's saying, once we've crossed this line in our, in our drinking and drug taking, there's no way back. There's no way back. And that's quite a difficult thing for somebody in addiction to actually come to that realisation that I've had to concede, I've had to surrender to my innermost self, to my, to my gut, not to anybody else, but I'm completely convinced deep inside myself that I can never safely drink or use drugs again. You know, no matter how long I don't do it, I know that I can't do it. So sometimes my head looks at, you know, I'll get a tray of, you know, it's my turn to buy a round and I've got a tray of like 10 lagers in the summer and I'm, carrying it back to the table and you're kind of looking at this lager and you're thirsty because I want to drink my lemonade and lime and you see that nice glistening gold amber neck to like the adverts with a white head and that bead of liquid running over the side and down the side and, and the summit and you go oh it'd be so nice to have a bite but then very quickly something kicks in my head makes me recall from a flame that says John can't drink i'm an alcoholic and i can't just have a pint i'm, I'm not just gonna have a pint it's gonna bring the gates of hell on me and i'm gonna end up in pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization now i spent a lot of my early life there 
Now, I can say things that are wrong sometimes, and I can have some pretty uncomfortable feelings, but I've got to be honest, since I've been in recovery, I've never felt incomprehensible, pitiful demoralisation. But I promise you, as most of you know, that used to be what was what I felt when I woke up every morning. I haven't felt it since. So we like that we've lost our legs. You ain't growing back new ones. So put that idea out of your head. Because I think, cause, and the reason that I want to say this, and I'm going to finish in a minute, because I want to give you guys a lot longer to feed back your point of view, is that, that again, today, it's just important to realise that because you still see a lot of people that, one, they just constantly won't accept this programme. But I think it's because they just can't accept that they're never going to drink again or never going to take a drug again. And until they actually get the treatment, it's very hard for them to get out of that state of mind. But when they come into a meeting, there's this window of opportunity that opens up for them. But until they get this thinking into their mind, they're never going to be able to formulate the ability to make the choice not to do it anymore. So they get stuck in that cycle. So it says uh, to appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. So again, there's that distinction. There's something different about this kind of alcoholic and addict. You can have an every drinker, every drug taker, but they're not necessarily alcoholic. Give them a sufficient reason to stop and moderate, they do. If they can control their drinking and their drug consumption, then they're not this type. They do not have this problem and they do not have this malady and they do not have this maladjustment. This, this is a, a type of person. He said, we have tried every imaginable remedy. In some instances, we have had been brief recovery, followed always by still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing in making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholic are not going to believe they are in this class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves the exception to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. So, that mindset comes into recovery with people on lots of different levels. See, this is the bit I wanted to get to, and then I'm going to shut up. It says this, I learned that I had to concede to my innermost self that I couldn't drink and take drugs like other people. Now, other people could control their drinking, and they could stop, they could moderate. But see, my argument here and the point I'm trying to make today is, is that that obsession comes into recovery with people. That some of them may say, you know what, I can honestly see that I've got to stop drinking, I've got to stop taking drugs. But then they think they're like other people. Now, other people that come into recovery that don't need the program well, they can just stop and moderate. Now, they may appear like an alcoholic. They may appear like an addict. But it's like saying somebody with diabetes is getting better without having insulin. Well, they can't be diabetic then, can they? That's just what I've concluded. If you're getting better without, if you're, di say, I'm a diabetic, but you're getting better without the insulin, then you're probably not diabetic, are you? Was telling me that if you're getting better without the treatment, then you're probably not this kind. So that feeling of like other people can transfer into recovery. So, and what I mean by that is when they come in and see that other people that possibly in recovery not doing the program and getting better, then they think they don't have to do it themselves and then they relapse. See, I can't drink like other people, but I also cannot not drink like other people. 
see that other people don't need this program other people can stop and moderate even though they may appear to be quite alcoholic in their drug drinking so i can't drink like other people but i also can't recover like other people i need this program they don't need that program and so that's my argument probably controversial but i think it needed to be said because again it's in this book it's not just in my life experience it's actually written in this book and it's a big concern to me that people aren't getting treatment and again it goes bigger than aa i think society is making that mistake it's not giving people the right treatment and i think the evidence is they're not getting well so i'll leave it at that and let you guys uh, share some of your experience around that thank you thank you for that talk lester um you come from a lot an awful lot of experience so anyone who's not been around too long could really do themselves a big favor by listening to what you just said your experience is mine is mirrored the same you know i've not been here you know when long as you and uh, I've not got the depth and wealth of experience that you have, but I have sponsored a lot of guys and I still do. And um, <clears throat> I don't think you're controversial at all. I think you're absolutely spot on. You know, there's a difference between alcoholism and an alcohol problem. Alcoholism, you know, it, it encompasses all those things. The three, the, the three parts of our psyche that are not well, you know, and someone with an alcohol problem just drinks too much. And uh, I ain't got a lot more to say. I just wanted to support you in what you just said and say it mirrored my experience absolutely to a T. You know, I, can, I, I cannot diagnose another alcoholic in my experience. They must come to that conclusion themselves, but I can give them all the pointers and direction to see where they recognize. Because if, if I recognize myself in this book, if they recognize themselves in this book, then the answer, and again, you're spot on, mate, that the success rates, recovery rates, when this first started was huge. But it's got diluted. And that's not being controversial. It's, it's got diluted. If you come straight out of this book, you will recover without any shadow of a doubt because that's been my experience so uh it's good to see you mate hope you had a great weekend and i'll leave it there thanks fox thanks, thanks mate. Mike. well hey. again just wanted to highlight that you know it's like it's it's what he's saying in the in the book there when you actually sort of study it out he's saying that we come to understand the malady that we have and then when we go and speak to a new guy that if we tell him that malady that we've been suffering from then he should be able to identify that himself so it's not we don't go telling him you're an alcoholic i go there and say i'm an alcoholic and this is the malady and he go that's what's happening to me and i think if you watch the film um bill wilson's story you'll see the third one that's kind of what they realize that when we do a 12-step call we don't go and tell them they're alcoholic we go and tell them i'm an alcoholic and then we explain the malady that we were going through and then he should identify with that hi uh, uh thanks for that lester um yeah i think you know when i first started going to see doctors long before i'd gone to aa i think they dealt with um me as if i had an alcohol problem and not that i was an alcoholic you know because all the suggestions they make are about cutting down and my um first experience is with AA when then I made that call and they came out again I feel I feel that they dealt with me as if I just had an alcohol problem again because they told me to go to a meeting that night and try not to drink in the day and I said how how do I do that and they said well tidy up your kitchen drawer have a bath take the dog for a walk 
um, you know, and then, and then get to this meeting. Well, I couldn't do that. Uh, and I got to the meeting and I had been drinking. And then I, I, what I took from that first meeting that it really wasn't good to go to a meeting after drinking because they didn't like people that drank at AA. Um, so it was a, it was a, all they said is just keep coming back, just keep coming back. And I couldn't see how that was going to stop me drinking just by going back, you know, and I felt in the end that it was a catch 22. I needed to be sober to go to AA. Um, and I couldn't do that. So for me, rehab was the only way to do it. I needed some time out of society, but I needed to understand how to get sober and, and that there was a program there and there were, and, and the principles and the, the whole thing. But I didn't get that from AA. And this is just my experience. I didn't get that from AA at all in the beginning. Um, coming out with some more understanding and, and, and managing to get some sober time. And um, then, yeah, that, you know, the meetings and going back to the meetings have been really, really useful. But right at the beginning, I don't think I was treated like I was an alcoholic. I think I was treated more like I just had a drink problem. Anyway, thank you, Lester. I'll leave it there. Oh, hi. Yeah, hello. Thanks, Lester. I just wanted to say really... I don't find any of what you say controversial. I find it reassuring because it means that, that, that if I work from this book, then I have got, as um, Eliza was saying, I can treat myself for my um, illness of alcoholism addiction. Um, I, I suppose it's what the, the only question I've got in all of that is you're talking about it, where it says, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. And you're talking about 25% of people that despite doing this, don't get recovery or don't, don't, um, aren't able to, to stop drinking or using drugs. And I just wondered if you know, can you identify what the, what the 75% of people are doing right and what the 25% of people aren't doing or anything like that? Or is that a total mystery? Uh, well, again, like, I, can, I, I can only, um, like I can only give you, uh, you know, I think again, just for the experience of what they, that, that statistics in the uh, in the big book. It's let's see if I can find it quick. It says uh, uh, for this were two principal reasons. Um, there are large numbers of they made this impression of alcoholics who come to AA and really tried. Fifty percent got sober at once and remained that way. Twenty five percent sobered up after some relapses. And among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. So I think when you're actually dealing with people, and again, I think certainly doing this as a job, and I think anybody that sort of been on the front line, there's lots of um, issues that people have. And again, it's uh, society's really not been that great at treating them. So there's all sort of difficulties and traumas. There's not very good interventions. You know, it's, it's kind of like this. You get somebody coming to rehab because they really want to stop drinking or taking drugs and they've got an emotional trauma. And as soon as they sort of start feeling that trauma, which you kind of would want them to do, they're able to just take off. And so what really needs to happen is that they need to be held a little bit longer. You know, their families can really do that with good interventions. I mean... A lot of people, if their families, you know, the biggest, the people with the biggest enablers are always the hardest to help because every time they get a feeling, they run off, you know, and their mum's picking them up out the front of our rear before we even know they're gone. And so, again, because it's people, there's there's lots of different things that goes on inside people. But, you know, the, the goal is, is that when society understands treatment and intervention, I reckon that they could probably almost, you know, start eradicating addiction out of um, the humanity, at least with the extreme drug and alcohol addiction in, in not too many generations. that It could be identified at a very young age and you wouldn't have to spend 20, 30 years screwing yourself up. It's, you can pretty, once you understand this mental condition, you can kind of see it in young people. And then society just lets them go off and, and 
you know, like I say, when you bring all of them consequences to the forefront, you know, if you think about when you were given your first sufficient reason to stop or moderate, it was probably not too long after you started. And you could start seeing the consequences build up, but nobody really does anything about it. They want to punish you. They want to reject you. They want to push you away, but they don't see your behavior as a sign that something is going wrong for you and that it could be treated very early on. So, you know, look, even today, we last year, I think we talked to nearly 90 to 100 A&E staff which are front line. I mean, they see the most people that are most distressed going into their A&E and they really have zero treatment. All they do is they tell you, give them fluids, do their vitals and then kick them out within four hours if, or send them somewhere else that's not going to help them. You know, again, it's like you start realising, man, the treatment is just so bad. So I don't think there's any sort of thing that you can put your finger on but what i do know is if you stick in this program and you keep doing it you start to find out how you can overcome certain things but you know again i've got men in, in my life and some women that have i've been talking to them for over sort of 10 years and they've never achieved sobriety but for whatever reason they can't or won't actually do the program but they still talk, we still talk, and they, they're quite conscious of that because they, they need a different kind of treatment that I don't think that they're getting so that, so that then, they, you know, we probably kind of guess that they've got a real deep trauma that they can't deal with. So when they actually start doing the program, it starts connecting them, connecting them to that. But then again, I'm not a big believer in, you know, EMDR is going to solve everybody's problem and it's the cure to AA. I know the people that are doing it believe that, but they want you to. But I don't see any greater results for everybody doing that either. Again, it, it just there's a lot of different treatments that people need. It's just being able to say, let's get their drug and alcohol problem sorted out and then we can look at what other treatments that they need. Because, again, look, living your life as an alcoholic and a drug addict is pretty traumatic, isn't it? So if having this allergy started you off, but then actually living in that experience for so long, I mean, that's going to cause problems of his own. I mean, you know, living the life as a drug addict and alcoholic, I mean, if you haven't got some sort of, you know, um, trauma just from that, it's like, what's the difference of that a lot of the time than going into battle? You know, you probably are going to have some flashbacks and, can't think of actually the word for that. Um, uh, what do they call it? Eleanor, what do they call that? Where you, the soldiers get it. I can't think of the name of it. PTSD. PTSD, that's it. You know, of course you're going to have some of that if you've been living as a... But again, I don't think just any one treatment's going to work for anyone. EMDR is going to work for some people. We're actually looked at something that we think maybe a little bit more i don't want to say better but maybe um a lot more accessible called rewind uh, and we think that 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 may be a good treatment but again i don't think any of them are good treatments instead of this program because this program actually is more about equipping you with important principles that help you deal with whatever comes your way but again all them other treatments can be part of that without a shadow of a doubt so i don't think there's anything that one thing that causes that it's each case has to be looked at in its own merits i think mm -hmm.